and it's brilliant to be here. I've read a lot about it. I've read that there are some really innovative retail concepts here. So I'm super excited to experience them for myself. I think as a former retailer, uh, conferences like this are a breath of fresh air. You know, it's at, at one extreme level, it's like group therapy. You're not the only person going through this. Everyone else is facing challenges. They just may be facing it and coming at it in a different way. It's a really long time. I've been associated with the MECSC since 1995. So that's like, I think it's almost uh, 24, 25 years. It's been very helpful for us as an organization and also personally for me in terms of my own growth. We network with people and without people getting to know, they tell us so much about what's going on, you know. And So it's actually been quite exciting for me to come to the Retail Congress because Dubai has nobody on the streets. They're all in the malls. But you get inside the mall and there is all society. There are people with all sorts of, you know, physical enhancements. It was like a gigantic mating dance as well as consumption at scale and this is the perfect place to look at where the mall goes. As an exhibitor for the last seven eight years we are here uh, our experience is very good we are meeting retailers we are meeting other investors as well sharing with them the ideas what's in the market how the changes are happening in order for all of us to share and see what we are going to do in future. It's a really interesting conference, uh, not only in networking, which is for sure a really important uh, part, but also to learn um, uh, from other companies what they are doing, how they are tackling. I think you can see it by the number of people attending and uh, also on the level of attendees that it's a really, really great conference. It's always a pleasure to be part of Retail Congress. The reason being like all retail fraternity comes together, uh, they talk about the way forward we always see some of the deals happening in this Retail Congress and it's always beneficial for all of us. I am uh, with the Middle East Council of uh, Shopping Center since uh, eight years, something like that. We are here today in uh, Recon. We hope it's fantastic. It's a very nice event to, to collect all these people here to be. Uh, last year was the first year. This year is much better because we are a little bit more experienced about what Recon can offer us. Last year we were just exhibiting and we had a stand. This year we are having these B2B meetings, which is going very well for us. Actually, I came, I came uh, as a visitor a few times, and today well, this is our first stand. The, the experience is great. Uh, I think we are getting good interest, and uh, there is a lot of different projects happening all over the Middle East. Our CEO uh, is a staunch supporter of um, this whole event uh, and has been for some time, as you say. One of the things we've noticed is it brings together such a diverse amount uh, of people. The clients are not just from one area, one sector, they're from a number of sectors and we're able uh, to meet them here and show what we can do, which is, which is great for us. And now we have a superb lineup of speakers and highly acclaimed retail leaders. And uh, first joining us with today is John Knight, the general manager of AW Rustomani Lifestyle. John has a track record of delivering omni-channel growth in sales and profits for internationally recognized brands, including Coach, Topshop, Mother Share, Mother Care, and Nespresso, for example. Having led <coughs> successful businesses in the UK, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East, John is a very skilled retail business leader. And for another highly acclaimed speaker for today, joining us as well is Ben Chezer, the founder and CEO of Conic. Having worked for over 10 years as a consultant for some of the Europe's largest retail brands, Ben founded Conic in 2014 to make advanced tools for retail giants readily available to every businesses in the industry with a clear mission to demystify technology and put the power back in the hands of marketeers. And of course, David McAdam, the CEO of the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers. He's a senior global executive with a 40 year career in real estate development, asset management and sustainable revenue generation 
of large scale multi use projects, an exceptional leader who consistently transforms complex challenges into rewarding opportunities. Now, let me hand over the floor to our speakers now and open today's discussion. Please join me in welcoming uh, our speakers for today. Thank you, hey, Justin. John. Hi, thank you, Justin. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I'll uh, just start by giving a short introduction, although I don't know if I can top your introduction, Justin. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, let me just introduce A.W. Rostamani Lifestyle, a little bit about what we do. So we're part of the A.W. Rostamani Group, which is primarily uh, known for its automotive uh, business, and retail is a fairly new uh, division within the group. Um, we have a number of brands in the portfolio. Uh, the flagship brand would be uh, American Rag, uh, which is a multi-brand streetwear uh, department uh, business. Um, we've got several locations across uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, we also have a um, uh, luxury jewelry brand, Verne Milano. Um, and, uh, uh, and at the top of the portfolio, we have uh, Angel's Luxury Kidswear. Uh, and Angel's House is a number of heritage luxury brands, you know, such as Fendi, Burberry, Givenchy, Machino, brands that you would uh, no doubt have heard of for their heritage and history. Um, so I suppose the thing that links the three main uh, brands uh, within our portfolio is our, our strategy is targeted completely um, towards uh, improving uh, the customer experience and adding joy wherever we can. In some cases, uh, that's involved uh, a lot of work in terms of the back end to make the customer experience as simplified and as seamless as possible. Um, so that's a little bit about a little bit of background about myself and, and what we're looking to do. And like I say, thank you for the introduction, Justin. I'll hand over to, to the rest of the guys to introduce themselves and looking forward to the chat today. Go ahead, Ben. Thank, thanks, John. Um, thanks, Justin, also for the intro. I, lo I love hearing back the things that we said and that we do. And we're like, oh, yeah, we do that. Um, <laughs> so I'm the, the founder and, and CEO of Conic. Um, Conic, hopefully some of you have heard of, um, and if you haven't, then today you'll learn a bit more about what we do. Conic is a, um, is a SaaS platform, so we provide a tool to help uh, shopping centers and retailers build really good, powerful, and valuable, we put a big emphasis on the word valuable, um, digital engagement with their shoppers. So that, that could be a loyalty program. We run many, many loyalty programs. We've got 22 million consumers and members of our programs. Or it could be a digital engagement through an app or a website, um, or, or it could be helping businesses like AWR understand how they can use the data on consumers that they're gathering to really improve the customer experience. So we're all about this word engagement. And for me, engagement is about experience. Um, we work with something like 2,800 retailers. So we work with many, many shopping center businesses. And through them, we work with retail businesses from Gucci to Primark and from Starbucks to McDonald's. We're covering a, a broad, broad spectrum of retailers. Um, which gives us a pretty unique view, I think, of how people shop uh, across different brands and what really drives changes in behavior. Um, and it's only when you can see how people shop, I think, multi-brands that you really understand what triggers you need to, to encourage people to change their behavior and then how you can really improve that experience for them. Um, we, we have offices in London. We're based at London. We've got an office in Dubai um, with Francisco is on the call here somewhere. I've seen his little smiling face nodding. Uh, who heads up our team in Dubai, and we recently opened an office in Miami as well. So we're, we're spreading ourselves little by little around the world. Um, the focus today, what I'm really excited about, it's great to have John on the call, is this kind of the, the mystery of how do, you, how do you turn zeros and ones and data, and we're all running around collecting data and, and un, trying to understand our consumers, how do you turn that into real engagement? And, and we think, and I think the trick is this, the, the, the experience. How do you get something that seems mathematical and numerical and turn it into a really fantastic shopping experience. Um, and I think what we're gonna talk about a bit today as well is the fact that COVID has come along. And I think we're all going on this journey of understanding omnichannel and understanding how we create a seamless experience for our consumers. Um, what COVID has done is forced that conversation to be happening so much faster and so much more clearly um, than it was before. We've got some slides, David. I don't know how you want to run this, but we've got a, a few slides which help introduce some of the themes, and then um, we can talk around those as we as we go through the webinar. Great idea, Ben. Let's. Uh... 
Okay, so if you give me a moment. So, hopefully you can now see um, a slide. I think it's about seven slides, so don't worry, we're not gonna bore you to death with um, too much slide material. But the, the aim of today really is to, is to raise a few key themes. Um, and then actually what I like to do, and, and great to have John on the call is, rather than talking about theoretical things that is we can all talk about engagement um, and we can all talk about data, but how do we actually really bring it to life in a store? So the first theme is this one. Can you guys see the screen? Yep. Yes. Yep. Thank you. So uh, experience-based shopper engagement strategy, there's quite a few buzzwords in there, so you can thank my marketing department for that. Um, but we, I think each word does say something really quite important. So. Conic really believes in engagement with consumers. We don't believe in just running loyalty programs for the sake of handing out a whole bunch of points and having them redeemed for whatever it is, air miles later on. We believe in running some kind of engagement program because you want to connect with your consumers. And to do that, consumers really expect you to understand what they want, that they're all different. Um, and I think one of the things that's happened in the last 18 months is this gap between consumer expectation and what retailers and retail destinations were able to deliver, has got bigger. Um, online retail is taking a huge step forward. Some businesses are getting really good at personalization online. And yet, sort of 80% of the transactions still happen offline or we're going back into that world now, um, where we have traditionally very little view of the consumer and very little way of customizing the experience. As John will probably know better than me, if you're running a store and Ben Chesser walks in, it's quite hard to make Ben Chesser feel in any way that that store is personalized to him, but it's not impossible. And so what we're looking at today is, is how do you get that personalization and customization um, technology to really create these personalized experiences online and offline. And for the consumer, they shouldn't really care about how that's being done. They should just have a great experience. So we're gonna throw a sentence out here and say, if you don't have uh, an experience-based engagement strategy, you won't survive the next 10 years. And I think retail in the Middle East is probably one of the hottest places for innovation and driving customer experience. Most of the world um, looks to the Middle East and perhaps Asia to see what's happening in the, in the next three to five years. And so I'm expecting competition there to really heat up. Um, I've said this before, but the, the, the change was already happening. We know that we've been at the conferences, we've talked about experience in shopping malls, for the last five or six years. Um, we've talked about making them destinations. We've talked about retailers really focusing on that experience and some retailers like Nike, they do it extremely well or Gucci. Um, but I think now that the bar has been raised and if you're not doing this, you become a commodity. It's gonna be very, very hard to compete with, uh, with pure play online retailers if you can't deliver that experience. On that slightly controversial note, because I've just slightly said, John, your business is under threat. What, what's your view of this? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, it completely was under threat unless we were, were willing to adapt. Um, thank you, Ben. I mean, when, when we sat down um, to, to, to write our strategy for, for the next three years post-COVID, uh, we were very much aware that um, if we were in a position where we were only competing on product and price, we were going to lose um, significantly. And we decided to um, continue to try and develop our, our experience, uh, uh, customer experience-based strategy. Now that involves uh, a number of uh, sort of uh, uh, softwares and technologies which almost have to work as an ecosystem behind the scenes in order to, to, to supplement that fantastic seamless customer experience. So one of the first things we did when we decided we wanted to work with Conic um, as a partner, first of all, Conic, you know, they have fantastic experience, um, uh, not only locally here uh, in the Middle East, but also globally. Um, and we, we were very much looking for a partner that understood uh, our key uh, priorities. And those priorities were based around, we were looking for a loyalty uh, and CRM platform that added value to our, our loyal customers experience rather than, as Ben said, simply giving discounts or promotions um, or points. Um, so we, we set out to, to almost write down what would be the dream customer experience. You know, if I take a, a fashion or a fashion flagship. Yes. Sorry. 
Oh, someone just chipped in there. Uh, if I'll just carry on. If I can take our um, our fashion flagship of American Rag C, uh, we 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 wrote down what would be the dream scenario. You know, if for a VIP customer, what would they like to see? So we set about writing that uh, dream customer journey from start to finish, and and thankfully we are we're eighty percent of the way there to completing that first draft of the dream scenario. So. To put it in, in kind of, uh, to give it a bit of meat on the bones, what that means is our customer can, uh, based on uh, uh, if they're a loyal member, they will arrive uh, at the car park in Dubai Mall and they can be picked up by a buggy and brought to directly to the store um, without having to walk. They can, in advance, request to the live DJ in store their favorite song um, so that they will get a shout out as they arrive. Um, and their favorite song might be in the rotation of what's going to be playing. Crucially, it's a single view of customer online and offline. So if our customer is uh, uh, RFID loyalty chip enabled, the, the customer, um, anything that they may have reserved or, or looked at on the website in terms of things they've hold, held in their basket, the stylist in store will be very much aware of what the customer um, has, has uh, uh, requested uh, in their basket. So that omni-channel experience of what um, uh, you've reserved online is also available for you in store. Now, as Ben pointed out as well, customization and personalization of product um, has, been, has been essential in the past few years, especially in the luxury sector. But what American Rag is all about and our strategy is built around is customizing and personalizing experience. So we've worked with our partners of, in Actimirror and, and, and Pepper Robotics to uh, enable uh, a very unique shopping experience. You know, if you go inside our fitting room, you can select your own music that you would like to be playing while you get dressed. You can select the type of lighting that you might want um, to see, uh, whether it be you know nightclub lighting, whether it be daytime lighting. Um, and not only that. We are developing right now avatars for each of our key stylists so that customers eventually will be able to choose their preferred stylist based on that, that individual's uh, personal taste. So the personalization of experience is something that we needed a loyalty uh, partner to support uh, that, that sort of uh, ambitious technology. And thankfully, I believe we found that in Conic. We're very excited to be launching the, Co the Conic uh, and AWR loyalty program. Um, hopefully, hopefully I say, um, by uh, the second week of November. Um, and that's going to give us a nice uh, introduction, um, first, first of all, for American RAG and understanding uh, loyalty customers there, but also then opening it up to the wider group and our precious jewelry brand, Vernier, and our luxury kidswear brand, Angels. Ben, I hope that answers uh, at least your first, yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, first point. Thank, thank you, John. That's uh, really interesting. I think it's amazing how you've taken the personalization into the physical store. And there's a, a lot of people talk about it, but I'm re really excited to work with you guys because you've actually done it and are doing it. Um, and it, it also makes me think we have another client in Europe, which is Bista Village, where they tend to be a few years ahead of the rest of the industry, a similar way to, I think, how you guys are of taking ideas of how do we how do we create a personalized experience? How can we think about the ideal, the most amazing shopping experience for our top tier customers and then deliver it? And pretty quickly, once you go through different options, so you could like, you've got John, you can pick people up from the car park, they can choose the music, they can see an avatar of the stylist. You can really start to combine these elements, I think, to create, um, to create these personalized experiences. Something then that Conic really believes in and bringing on to the next page, you said we're, we're hopefully gonna launch um, in, in November. The challenge then is how do you do this at scale? And, and things sound easy, but, but you know, just the fact, of, like you said, of someone going to be able to pick you up from the car park in a buggy, a lot of things and processes have to happen to make that an enjoyable experience for the consumer. Um, and if you're going to deliver that kind of luxury, it's got to be done in a way that's a real kick for the consumer. It's got to be seamless and beautiful and perfect. The minute they have to wait five minutes or the guy doesn't turn up at the right car or whatever, you've got a problem. You've turned what should have been a good experience into a bad experience. So um, one of the things we focus on is I see the customer experience delivering that as an iceberg. You've got like a little bit of it above the water, which is what the consumer should see. And that's got to be beautiful and seamless and, and clear. And if they've 
expressed a preference on your web store, please don't ask them again the same, you know, the same question when they come into the app or don't ask them the same question when they're in the store. You should know that about them already. Um, and then so the top of the iceberg is what the customer sees. And then underneath this massive amount of work and connection has to go on, usually connecting multiple different systems in a way that the consumer really doesn't need to know about and should never know about. But that's the hard work of the suppliers like Conic and, and then the clients like John and his team. And so delivering that is really hard. It's not something that I, I, I know we see and you can deliver very quickly. And then delivering that in a way where you combine multiple suppliers is even harder because typically each supplier has got their view of how their product should be displayed to a consumer or how it should be consumed. Um, but it's the job, I think, of the brand and the digital team in the brand to bring it all together and curate a really great experience. So um, we say that the consumers choose the brand for the experience. So the product is important. It's definitely important. But increasingly around that product is the experience. And that's not just the lighting and the music in the store. It's how the staff are trained. It's also what your social media presence is, what kind of messages you communicate through influencers, what kind of advertising you do, where you advertise. All of this creates a perception of your brand um, that's got to be really carefully curated. And the minute one of those things is not in, a, in line with what you want to communicate, consumers notice it. So we're seeing Conic increasingly being part of a much bigger picture where we'll be plugging into people who are really good at uh, in-store experience or good at lighting or they're good at um, giving information back to the staff or they're good at recognizing consumers through RFID. And we're trying to become the brain that, that links this all together to create this seamless experience. So I'm sure John's got more work more scars than we have, that these things sometimes are really, really difficult to deliver, but when it's done right, it's a, it's a great thing for the consumer. Does that, does that resonate, John? Absolutely. Yeah, you're not wrong um, in terms of the scars. We've definitely got the scars to prove it. Um, like I say, it sounds, it sounds very easy to say what that dream experience looks like and articulate it, but having that network of software and, and partnerships behind it um, is completely another thing. You know, we have more than 150 brands inside American Rag, you know, from, from global recognition, um, globally recognized brands, all the way down to, to small kind of startup uh, local brands uh, here in the UAE. And uh, one of the most challenging aspects of this uh, development of this experience has been to align priorities amongst all these partners, not only, you know, from a supplier perspective, but also aligning our priorities with that of the mall. Um, you know, all of it, we have fantastic relationships with, uh, with the shopping malls. Uh, and, I, and I still believe, I'm sure David uh, um, will be able to elaborate, but I still believe Dubai um, offers some of the best shopping malls in the world um, in terms of customer experience. So partnering with, uh, partnering with the malls, you know, being very upfront about what our, our desired strategy um, looked like um, and seeing where their priorities um, aligned was absolutely key to, to, to the success um, of, of executing the strategy. I've Thank got a, a couple of things. Ben, if you don't mind, I have a question to jump in here uh, just to um, maybe clarify a couple of things that maybe some of the people who are watching or listening might have questions on. It was very clear for you, John, you needed to do something at the Al Rasmani Group to make things work better for you. But there were probably some key points that became very clear to you that you had to do something that required you to sort of reach out to uh, what Ben does and others do in industry. But let me first ask you, Ben, and I know this is a silly question, but this is coming from a point of let's get to understand this a little better. What are the key signal points that you would suggest are very important for your clients to understand that they need your help? No, it's a simple question, but yeah. is there any particular to you, John, and, and to Ben, maybe reach out? What are the points that are necessary that people have to look at themselves and say, gosh, I really could use the help of Conic, and gosh, I should connect with John to figure out how Rastamani really has been helped in this? Ed, ben. So it's a very good question. So I think we see two there's usually two main triggers. One would be a, a company that's got basically no customer data. They might have an email database, but that's it. They're not really collecting any other information about what the consumers like or don't like or what they purchase or don't purchase. Um, so 
so a starting point for us is a business that wants to build a data set. And if you said to the, the marketing team or the CEO, wouldn't you like to know what every one of your customers is buying and, and how long they're staying in the store and how often they're coming into the store? And they'll say, yeah, I'd love to know that, but it's really hard. That's where we come in and go, it's not actually really hard. It's a matter of just thinking about the strategy and thinking where to start. So it's that step from email database to actually a CRM where I understand customer behavior. And then a second trigger point, which probably is a bit more relevant here, actually, in this example, would be a business that's tried a number of digital initiatives. It's, it's got its head in the game about understanding customer experience. But then it's realized that if you don't bring these all together and tie them together, and it's not going to work. You're going to end up with silos and one project that gave a good ROI and another one that didn't, but there's no way of connecting them together. So we often see that consulting firms involved. There's a strategy project to figure out how do we actually do this in a scalable way. And that sometimes means, sorry, David, you can try something out. You can launch a digital experience or you can try robots or mirrors. And, and if it doesn't work, you can stop it. You need to have a strategy to test stuff and see what works and, and stick with the stuff that's good. That's that, all I'm like, yeah, if, I, if I could just add to that. Yeah, no, that's a good thing. That, what, why do I need you? It's great. It's perfect. I like the answer. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, David, just adding on to, to, to what Ben said there was one of, one of the the sort of massive indicators that we had was we, we, we really wanted to understand uh, when we had that dwell time uh, uh, increasing and customers were, were spending more time in store, um, how could we replicate that experience online? You know, because customers were, were landing on our, our website and, or, our, or our app uh, and, and spending nowhere near um, the same amount of time in terms of consideration. So how can we add value to experience when you're, you're, you know, you're browsing through a website? So we had to look at, okay, we have a styling service in store. We offer a personal shopping and styling experience. How does that translate online? You know, how can you offer personalized styling or outfit building suggestions um, through an automated platform? And that, you know, uh, as I'm sure you'll understand, involves a, a huge amount of work in the back end with your ERP system, making sure that, you know, we are completely a single view of product and a single view of customer um, across the business, which is a lot easier to say than it is to achieve. Um, another big uh, sort of trigger point, I guess, would be um, we wanted to, to make sure that um, whenever we were rewarding uh, customers, we wanted to make sure that we had other, other rewards to offer other than, than product discount. And what we found in Dubai is, you know, from our perspective, um, what drives our customer behavior is very much exclusivity and newness and hype around brands, much more than discount or promotional activity. Um, and, and we felt like the online space in, in, in the Middle East became a bit of a, a fight of who could offer the, the cheapest and who was willing to accept the lowest margins uh, for certain product. And we decided we didn't want to really compete in that space because uh, there's never going to be a winner. There's always going to be someone who can undercut you. Um, so we felt like, okay, let's not go, let's not try and uh, appeal to the masses. Let's really look after our loyal customer base and how you can get that uh, in-store experience online. And that's why we've engaged with Ben and his team, you know, to try and make sure that that, that customer experience that, you know, hopefully we've become known for um, just in these last couple of years, uh, soon uh, that customer experience will feel exactly the same, whether you're shopping with us through social media or whether you're shopping with us through our application or through the, 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 the Shopify platform. Just to, to jump in as well, David, one thing that we're in a post-COVID world more than ever being asked to do is is measure the ROI. So the, the, the exciting, fun, sort of sexy bit is the experience and, and investing in the new, you know, the, the driving that experience as far down the road as we can for consumers. But then the businesses are looking at it and they want to see an ROI. They want to know, is it actually delivering value to my business? So by tying together what experiential elements the consumer has been involved in. So were, did they go to the VIP lounge or were they picked up in the buggy or did they have a hands-free shopping which, by the way, is one of the things we do in malls, which drives the most increase in spend, the most is hands-free shopping. So, so can we tie that experience through to actually are they spending more money? And maybe they're not, it's not just about are they spending more money today. It might be that they're becoming more loyal, they're coming more frequently, they're having a higher dwell time. So it's, it's linking the exciting experiential with the bottom line. Is it, is it generating sales or not? That's become way more important than it was five years ago or three years ago even. 
Yeah, it's a trend that I've seen a lot too. And, you know, earlier, I think, uh, Johnny mentioned that Dubai has uh, some very sophisticated retailing. Yes, globally, Dubai still ranks very much at the top part of, uh, of what's available in the shopping globally. So um, one of the things that I'm looking at when I'm looking at all of this, and I know I've had some questions of people who were talking to me before. So how do you justify the costs associated for what you are offering in your services in your company Ben, to, to make it feasible financially? And I know maybe this gets into a territory where you don't really want to jump in too deeply, but it gives us an idea so that when we're budgeting, for, because we're in the budget territory now, October is usually the budget period for the next year. What do we need to budget for to look at what we need to, uh, because we want to, you know, look and see what we can do to increase our, our performance. So, so uh, I'm not going to, John, you go first, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right, uh, David. Uh, you, 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 you almost, uh, you could have been a fly in the wall when I first uh, proposed the, uh, um, our, our investment uh, uh, in this particular partnership. Um, the first thing finance and a board of directors would want to see is what's our return. Um, and, and what we felt like uh, um, uh, a platform like this offered was, yes, uh, as Ben said, loyal customers, it's, there's, there's a history that loyal customers, first of all, will spend more. Secondly, they will show up more frequently. Uh, and thirdly, they will be brand ambassadors and hopefully bring new customers uh, to your business. But that's much harder to, to, to convince um, without hard, hard and fast um, uh, history uh, of numbers. Um, so we looked at a couple of other partners that Conic had worked with. We saw some case studies uh, that, that uh, some partners had, had, had proven um, uh, to, to have enormous success uh, partnering uh, with Conic and, and their particular uh, 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 mechanisms uh, of creating loyalty. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, we absolutely uh, had to do is we had to be very tough in our in our discussions with Conic, and say that you know all of all of your uh, all of your remuneration for this partnership is very much linked to our incremental sales, um, and that that was key to convincing you know a board that it was worth a, a significant investment you know that that could have otherwise been spent with marketing. I think you could probably sum up our approach, you know, in terms of uh, rather than having a scattergun approach um, and trying to target everybody, what Conic has allowed us to do is attack the market with a scalpel rather than a hatchet. Um, so we've been able to really select those VIPs um, who, who are going to add value and, and become loyal customers and spend, you know, um, significantly more than if we were just to try and, 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 and attack everybody that, that, that came near our business. Ben, I don't know if you, if you agree uh, with any of that. Uh, about you guys being tough negotiators? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I agree. So we, we, we've got years of data and we're very happy. One of the nice things is we do measure sales. So we're not just putting stuff in and say, we think it has a, a halo effect on your business. So we me we're measuring sales. So um, we're very happy to stand behind numbers. and. John alluded to the model that we've, we've got on this particular project, but it's a model we're doing more and more now is some form of, of shared risk. So if we can prove that we're generating incremental sales, then we get well paid for it. And if the sales are not being delivered, then, you know, the cost for, for running the conic is much lower. Um, and that means we have to do a bit more due diligence on the projects and make sure that we know that we're with a partner that's really going to sort of deliver on what they want to, what their plans are. Um, but we're doing this more and more now where it's a, a kind of shared risk. So, I think it's a good model for everybody, as long as uh, both parties are really, really serious about the project. Does that help, David? Yeah, very much. Thank you, Ben. That's great. Um, when I'm looking at um, all of my questions and I'm thinking, is there anybody else out there? Perhaps you go back to Justin or uh, Kay, whoever is back behind the scenes. Do other people who are listening to the webinar, do they have questions for both Ben, John, or myself that you want to uh, gather our thoughts on? Justin, any thoughts? Anybody back there who has a question? Hi, David. Uh, thanks so much for that. Um, 
So to all of our delegates attending this webinar, um, if you have any questions, please do raise your hand and uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat box. I wanted to just, just so while people are thinking, throw out an idea, because we've seen, um, we've seen different uses of this kind of technology, different mindsets in the retail space. So we also work for Caring, for example, which is a luxury retail group, and the different ways of seeing the world. Um, and some people look at the data and they want to drive operational efficiency. And I think in the Middle East, John said before, and I was worried about this two years ago, this discounting and discounting and discounting. And it's it's a bit of a race to the bottom. Right? It's good to see people sort of putting the brakes on and saying, right, this doesn't actually get us anywhere. Um, so we see some people using the data to drive efficiency. So the more you know about your consumers, the better you should get about predicting demand and you're doing the right purchasing. And, and we all know in retail, getting purchasing right is, is a huge opportunity. Um, and then other people talk about experience. And what I really like to see is businesses that they've got half a brain thinking about creating a great experience and half a brain thinking, yeah, but margins are thin in this industry. We've got to really also use that data to predict the future. And the better we can predict the future and the better we can target our product to the right consumers, um, the more efficient we can be in our operations. I'm just, and that's, I'm just interested to see from the audience, are people thinking more about spend, spend experience? Or are they thinking more about manage margin and, and control operation efficiency? Or both. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we have a question from one of our delegates, Danish Dubash. Danish, please go ahead. I think you're on mute, Danish. Uh, yes. Danish, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, many of the, uh, uh, thank you for this, uh, for allowing me to uh, uh, be vocal on this question. We have a, a number of malls over here, but we do not have a, a card, which is a, a mall card. But many of the brands inside the malls have their own uh, loyalty card, uh, whether it's, it's um, RFID chip or, or not. They even use a magnetic strip till today, but they have the loyalty card in place. So many brands have their loyalty card in place and they, um, uh, in our agreements with the retailers and our tenancy agreements, we have mentioned that uh, the mall will come up with a loyalty card. However, when we go to propose a, a loyalty card from the mall's perspective, uh, they say that we cannot give them a, di a discount that is better than the discount that we as a brand are offering them. So how does one really address this? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question, right? Um, I'm going to tackle two concepts here. And that, so one is the brands are increasingly launching their own programs. They, they all are. Um, and and they, they need to see then that the mall program is different. It's not better or worse. It's different. So when someone comes to a mall, and the malls are massive right in the Middle East, so typically somebody is going to shop one or two, maybe 3% of the stores in the mall, any individual customer. So the brand will have a really good view of the people that shop its brands, if it's got a good loyalty program, but it won't have a view of the 97% of people that don't. And it won't know when someone comes into their brand, they come into Nike, are they also shopping Under Armour before or after? Are they spending more or less? So the mall's yeah. program's objective is to give that bigger view of the customer and the ability for the brand to actually communicate to people who are not yet their customers, to acquire new customers. And they need to, you need to, that, the brand needs to get that, that actually the mall program should help their program, not compete with it. When yeah. you come down to the, the, the issue of discounts, I think um, you get into slightly difficult waters about sort of what's called double dipping and can someone get your discount and their discount. We find that trying to be really clear with the consumer about what the rules are is, is fair. And we would always let the brands have priority. If it's an existing member, loyalty member of their program, then the brand feels ownership of that customer, they should have priority. And the more should be trying to think of what else can I add to that customer experience that the brand can't do? And it can't just be about yeah. a discount. It's gotta be about something other than discount. Yeah, we no did try it. something. We tried something very unique. Um, and um, uh, what we realized is that um, we need to stroke the egos of the customers. They like to be asked, uh, they, like we, they like to be addressed by their name. So what we did was we tried to do something whereby we can get to know their name as they enter the mall and we send them, send them a small limousine ride uh, to take them around to the mall to see where they want to go. <laughs> and it actually started working out really well. 
And they said, okay, fine. You have to swipe your card. So then we put in a, um, a swipe machine inside each of the limos. So that, you know, you just have to pay one rupee. And that one rupee is basically like 0.1 dirham. So basically what that does is yeah. that uh, uh, it gives them the opportunity to put in that and swipe their attendance at a rate which is negligible. So what it comes up on their card. And then we know that they can't redeem it. It's just peanuts. But uh, their presence is valued over there. They go to, go to their shop. And then from there, if they want to make the limo driver wait, it, it waits. Otherwise, it goes off. So we realized that giving them a parking slot with their ease and um, in, in the mall parking, and then this uh, limo at the entrance or limo where they're in the mall, this worked out. But we didn't want to go with discounting because the brands are just not ready uh -huh. to give discounts. They want value addition. To the mall um, uh, owners, we have to speak to them and then tell them to squeeze out, cough out 2% more, 2.5% more from their annual budget, just so that we can retain customers and make their visits more frequently to these shops. So this is uh, something which um, we are trying to uh, combat here and uh, see how we can get, a, get it to work out. Uh, That's a good point, Danish. It's a good point. Thank you. And it's interesting that... Uh, it has to be a team effort to make all of this work. And uh, I think you've pointed out uh, getting the shopping center owners as well as the retailers, as well as the customers engaged. And I think the big upside from what you described was that there was information captured from people who swiped their card and who are, uh, and that's very valuable information. I think Ben, you could probably comment on that. I mean, it's a it's always a give get. If people will share data with you if, if there's a reason for them to do it and they get something back. And I think the, the clearer you can be about that, the better. Um, I'll give you a, a sort of a number that's really surprised me in the last month. So we've also now started putting location tracking into most of the apps that we build. We have an SDK, so we know when someone is near a mall or near an airport, or we can we can define areas and we can trigger messages to them. We also give them points and we say, just, just come to the mall. Don't have to go shopping. Just spend an hour and we'll give you some points. We'll give you a reward because we're trying to reward um, the behavior that, that we want them to display, you know, behavior that's good for the brand. And we've got 76% of people are giving us that location permission, which is, which is way higher than I expected. And the reason they're doing it is because we're very clear about why you're doing it. So people, I think, are willing to share information. You can make it as seamless as possible. Once they've installed the app, they don't have to do anything. And as long as they know why they're doing it, I think people will do it. They'll, they'll, they'll give the information in exchange for some kind of reward or recognition. I was just really pleasantly surprised at the number of people that said yes. What are Don, your I've got a question for you in the meantime. Go ahead, Ben, sorry. No, David, you go, you go. Over to you, David. Uh, John, I had a question for you with the uh, Rastamani um, Lifestyle Group. Tell us your plans in a nutshell for the next uh, couple of years. What do you see as the hot buttons and where do you see your growth coming from? Uh, well, that, that's, that's, that's the, the, the million dollar question. I, I guess um, the, the strategy is definitely continues to evolve around um, uh, personalizing customer experience. Um, it's about making uh, the the online or the social media shopping uh, easier and, and more accessible, and I suppose more um, simple than than making it more complicated. So we see uh, social retail being uh, a, 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 you know a very new but exciting revenue stream for us. You know. We, we probably, the majority of our customer engagement uh, comes through social media channels, uh, Instagram, and, and even for the younger, the younger audience, uh, TikTok. Um, and we, but what we also notice is that while that's the, the number one channel for engaging with the customers in terms of talking about new brands or talking about new products or, or, or value added experience in store, that's also the platform where customers want to communicate with us. So we're seeing a lot less um, kind of, you know, SMS interaction or email interaction. Um, and even on WhatsApp, we're, we're talking to customers about customer service, about taking orders all through social media. So we definitely see the development of social, social media retail um, as, as fundamental to, to, to completing that omni-channel uh, journey. So that's going to be a big focus for us. Another focus, I suppose, would be to, to just make the in-store experience 
all about uh, the fun part of shopping and, and simplify the pain point. So in terms of POS systems, we want customers to be able to transact anywhere in the store, you know, without having to necessarily go to a till point or POS point at, at one particular area in the store. So we want all staff, all stylists in the store to be able to, to transact a customer. You know, we see eventually customers uh, in particular locations being able to transact themselves very much like a supermarket type model, um, you know, if that's their preference, of course, it would be our preference to, to offer that, that personalized service, but some customers would, would happily shop with you without interacting with anyone at all. Um, so we basically see uh, offering the majority, um, um, uh, the maximum sort of uh, experience in terms of simplifying the customer's journey, making, pay, making payment, making data collection as simple and as seamless and as pain-free as possible and making the fun part of shopping uh, the, 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 the amount that, you know, the majority of the time that you actually spend there, both online uh, and offline. I hope that, that answers your question. Yeah, it does, thanks. Um, ben, back to you. I know we don't have a whole bunch of time left, maybe about another five, 10 minutes, but give me your idea, Ben, about what you see going on in the retail industry. You're right at the coalface every day helping people out to try and maximize their sales potential. What do you see in the next couple of years is going to be the trends coming or the hot buttons you should be focused on? Um, I'm going to build slightly on what John said. I think um, there's sort of two big areas that we're seeing. One is the communication channels. So whether it's WhatsApp or Instagram or TikTok are evolving faster and faster and faster. So Quantic, we're not the channel. We want to be the glue behind that. And I think the brands and the retailers and retail destinations are going to have to be able to manage many channels at the same time. Whereas previously it was, you know, you had above the line and you had email and then maybe SMS. And now the number of channels is huge and each channel will have its own audience. So one thing is being able to very quickly jump on a new channel, engage with it, and then move off the ones that aren't being used anymore or figure out which channel for which target. And we're trying to be agnostic to that and say, right, we should be able to plug into any channel and measure the performance. Um, and I think that John's right. The, the transacting as well will change. It's changing very quickly. People are beginning to transact in social media channels. They become the storefronts for some brands. Um, so rather than using the social media as a way of attracting customers and bring them into your web store, get in the channel, sell in channel if you can. Um, so, so the whole thing gets more complicated but also more powerful. And, and as Jonathan said, the physical store becomes a bit more like a website. I might go in and browse and not purchase. I might purchase on my own through my app, but actually physically in the store. But it all just gets mixed up, um, which is exciting. And we see a big role for us in that, sitting behind the scenes and trying to collect up all the data. Um, and then we see much more boring, but a really big problem now is what I call digital spaghetti is too many systems connected to too many systems and it just creates a mess in the background. Um, and if you don't get it right, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be stuck in the future. So you won't be able to make the changes you wanna make. So we're seeing a lot of businesses really thinking on how they get rid of digital spaghetti and they create a properly well thought out <coughs> architecture that means they can plug people like Conic in and out and they can plug providers in and out sensibly and seamlessly. And that's not easy. There's a lot of consultants running around trying to figure that one out, but if you get it right, it's very powerful. That's the less, the less exciting thing, but it's... No, but I get it. I, it makes sense too, by the way. And that's a great insight on it. I appreciate that. And uh, I like your term digital spaghetti because I, it conjured up exactly the kinds of challenges I see happening frequently in many different industries besides just what we're talking about. Uh, John, anything you'd yeah. like to wrap up with uh, as a party? No, just, uh, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, David. I love that term, digital spaghetti. I'm definitely going to be, uh, that's going to be uh, my number one agenda point for my next IT catch-up, for sure. Um, but uh, I just wanted to thank uh, yourself, David, for, for, for you know, talking us through um, this webinar. And, and Ben, you know, um, thank you for your support and partnership. We're really looking forward to, to um, the future partnership with Conic and AWR. Um, so it was a pleasure um, uh, uh, being able to talk about, you know, a small part of what we're doing. It's good talking about all the good things that we're doing rather than, you know, the pain points. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you, David, for, for, for allowing us to, to give our thoughts today.
Our pleasure. It's great. Um, thank you for being here as well, John. It's it's great, and I'm so pleased that Austin uh, Manning Group is, has gotten into this business and this industry. And is if there is anything more that we could do to help you and your business, I mean, uh, our team is always here, just as you know that Ben is. But our team is also standing by, ready to assist anyway. And we look forward to welcoming everyone to our. Uh, our Recon Retail Congress event on December 6th, 7th at the Ritz-Carlton DIFC because um, it's going to be a great event and we've had super support from our sponsors and from a lot of interest from uh, all over the place. So we're pleased with that. Ben, how about you? Anything else you'd like to um, uh, wind up with? Uh, I'd echo John. It's a really, it's a very exciting partnership. We, I love working with businesses that are very forward thinking. And yeah, we have to look at the numbers, obviously. And and retail has had a hard time, but it's great to be working with businesses that are looking to the future and and learning from what's changed in the industry and what has to change. Um, and I say I'm excited about the event. It's really good to be meeting people physically again. The Dubai events are always really, really good. I mean, we get really good quality of people there. So. Looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible um, in Dubai in December. That'd be fantastic.